So let's generate our motivation and really place the retreat very firmly within the context of being of benefit to others. And so in this way, remembering not to get so self-absorbed or to take ourselves too seriously, but really to have a joyful mind that wants to be of great benefit to all living beings, especially by leading them to enlightenment. So you're going <clears> to <throat> be starting your two-week vacation with Tara. <coughs> so really um, see it as a vacation, as an opportunity to really uh, relax your mind and enjoy yourself. Okay? And remember that the Buddhist definition of relax doesn't mean that you stretch out on the sofa and watch TV. <laughs> it means that you relax your mind and you have a sense of humor, you have a sense of lightness, you have some curiosity, your mind is awake and engaged. Okay? And, uh, you know, again, having fun from a Buddhist viewpoint doesn't mean you go skydiving or uh, to the disco or whatever. It, it means that you're having a good time becoming friends with Tara. Okay? So really see it in that way. And, uh, you know, switch your own mind to a different meaning of relax and having fun. Okay? And I, actually, I'd suggest taking the, that meaning of relax and having fun away with you when you leave the Abbey, too. Yeah, it'll make your life much more pleasant. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of different um, resources and materials that you can uh, use while you're doing the retreat. And that's why we have a study period in the afternoon. Um, I've been giving like short teachings on the Tara practice since we began in December. And since um, we weren't sure how many of you have been able to follow those, they will be showing at um, 4.30, yeah, every day except Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays in the, um, in the library. Okay, so that, that's your uh, cinema for the next two weeks. <laughs> no popcorn, sorry. And... Um, <laughs> You know, that, that will help you, you know, learn the practice. I'd also suggest that you study the Tara book, How to Free Your Mind, Tara the Liberator, and especially the, um, the uh, prayer by the, the young l uh, Lama about um, uh, his yearning to see Tara, okay? And it's quite an inspiring and beautiful um, prayer. And, you know, to remember from your side, I mean, Tara, see Tara as yourself when you're going to be a Buddha and you want to connect with, you know, yourself who is going to be a Buddha. Mm -hmm. So you're calling out to that Tara, becoming friends with that Tara, and so on. Okay, so those are some resources for you. And then, um, I'd really advise um, studying the stages of the path and also the thought training texts because uh, when you try and meditate, different distractions will come up in your mind and those practices in those texts will help you work with those distractions, okay? So that, uh, you know, when you're distracted by pleasant objects and your mind's 
roaming the universe looking for some external bliss, then you'll remember to think about impermanence or you'll know what the first uh, noble truth is and be able to meditate on that. Or when you're angry and, uh, you know, just waiting for retreat to end so you can call somebody and tell them off. Um, <laughs> then, you, you know, you might remember the, the uh, third of the six far-reaching practices uh, of fortitude or patience and, you know, and, and know the meditations to do on that. Working with anger is, is a very good synopsis of those major techniques. Okay, so the same for jealousy, you'll know to meditate on rejoicing and, and so on. And so that will really help you when different things come up uh, during the practice. Okay? Now, some people, uh, you know, we, we have to find a balance here because sometimes, I mean, distractions come and we begin to notice what the distractions are and we begin to see that we have a lot of issues that we need to resolve in order to have a peaceful mind. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is connecting with Tara and doing the practice. Okay? So we have to find a balance between these two. Some people focus so much on, okay, I've got to visualize Tara, and what color are her celestial silks? <laughs> and um, I can't get all the jewels on her earrings clear. <laughs> Uh, you know, and they get so, their minds get so tight, you know, trying to get everything perfect that, you know, they, they wind up like a, you know, a knotted ball, okay? So that's one extreme, okay? The other extreme is, oh, all these fascinating distractions, all my childhood issues, all my daydreams, all the places I was, went to in the past, and the conflicts I had with people, and the good times I had with people, and all these issues that I've got to work out. So where's my psychology textbook? And, you know, and then we psychologize on the meditation cushion, okay? And we get completely entranced in me and my childhood and my issues and what's going on in my mind and there was a thought of anger and there was so much attachment and look at my mind, it's terrible, it's worse than anybody else's mind here. Oh my God, oh but I can't pray to God, I don't believe it. <laughs> And again, your mind gets completely tight and totally self-absorbed, okay? So neither of those extremes work, yeah? You know, things come up, yes, you have to notice them, you work them out, but, you know, it's meditation, it's not therapy. So. You don't want to take yourself too, too seriously. Yeah, we have issues. Yeah, we need to practice the antidotes for attachment and aversion and things like that. Yeah. But don't get lost in your childhood. Your childhood is over. It is not happening now. It is your conceptual mind that is happening now. Yeah. So look at that conceptual mind and how much you enjoy going over all the events in your life with your conceptual mind again and again and again, you know, replaying the same old videos. Yeah. And that's why I so often tell people, you know, in retreats, we all write down, you know, our problems, put them in a bowl, and then you have to pick somebody else's problem. Or maybe we should all write down our childhoods, and then you have to, when you get distracted, you have to think about somebody else's childhood. Yeah? 
Now, if you think about it, somebody else's, if you have a Buddhist view, somebody else's childhood should be just as fascinating as your own. Because we're all empty of inherent existence, aren't we? And because none of those childhoods are happening right now. And because all of us are dependent on risings. So there's nothing special about your own childhood. I'm really sorry to say that. <laughs> and there's nothing so special about everything you've done in your life. Yeah, that you need to go over it 1,500 times. Now, like I said, things will come up that you need to work on. Work on those things. But don't get so attached to everything to every little thought that goes on in your mind. Okay? Because what is yours about a thought? Think about that. You know, some thought goes through. What is yours about that thought? I thought it. Who thought it? Did you think that thought, or did that thought just appear in your mind? And what's yours about that thought? And what is that thought anyway? Is that thought reality? That's why I keep telling people, don't believe everything you think, you know? It's just a thought. So don't, you know, get so... My thoughts. My emotions, my, my ideas, my life, my enlightenment, oh my. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've got to kind of loosen up a little bit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You never get so hooked on my chores. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just kind of relax and have a good time with Tara, okay? And try and see the good things in yourself and see the good things in other sentient beings. You know? I think we really have to consciously train ourselves to, to see the good things in life because we are so habituated with picking out the few things that we don't like yeah, or that don't happen the way we want or the few bad things. And that's what newspapers are made out of. Yeah, but then newspapers never report all the good things that happen. And so similarly in our lives, we, you know, how often do we really think of the kindness we've received from others? Yeah. And the fact that we're only able to be alive now because of the kindness of others. Yeah. And really let our mind rest in that so that we stop seeing everybody else as an enemy or as somebody to manipulate so that they get out of our way and we can find happiness or as somebody to get so because they make us happy. Yeah. But instead, let, let's really rest the mind in seeing the kindness. Because yeah. that way we feel connected with others and um, you know, it, it becomes much easier to work for the benefit of others. Hmm? Okay. And so remember in the retreat, too, that, you know, it, the retreat isn't just the meditation sessions. It's also what you do in the break times. Yeah. And so um, break times are really very important uh, because you know, our mind's a continuum, and what you do in the break times, you bring into the meditation hall. So that's why we're keeping silence as much as possible, so that we don't have to 
you know, create identities and get into conversations about this, that, and the other thing with other people, yeah? Uh, but give ourselves some chance to be with ourselves and uh, appreciate our own company and appreciate Tara's company. Okay, now I always um, recommend that people get some exercise every day. And uh, I've realized that a lot of people don't follow that recommendation. And then their, their minds get too tight, too narrow, and then they, their minds are unhappy. And I say, Did you, do you go outside and get some ex exercise every day and look long distances? Uh, well, mm, uh, I look out the window a little bit. <laughs> uh, you know, I walk from Kotami House here. Uh, really, you know, especially it, when it's nice weather like this, and even when it's cloudy, you know, get outside and feel the air and feel nature and look the long distances. It really stretches your mind out. And look into the sky and think of how many universes there are, you know, around all these different stars, and they all have sentient beings in them. Yeah? And we're just one little bitty sentient being, and there's all these, you know, universes full of sentient beings who have all been kind to us. No? And then just even think of all the sentient beings on this property, you know, the big ones, the small ones. <laughs> Yeah, when you're here in the summer, you really see a lot of sentient beings, you know? But, but it, it helps us get some perspective on things, okay? And, and also moving your body is important. You know, you don't want to be a couch potato. And, you know, you stretch. Yeah. Look the long distances and, you know, when you... When you walk in the snow and you see the, the footprints of the bunnies or of the deer, and just think about what their lives are like. Mm -hmm. yeah. and see the little birds, all the different birds, and think what their lives are like. Okay? So that you're, you're in touch with uh, the environment and the other living beings around you. Okay? So any questions so far? Okay. I thought that I would um, teach you one breathing meditation that uh, Lama Yeshe often had us do when we, before we uh, did sadhana practice. And uh, it's, it's very good just, again, for kind of clearing out the, the mind. So it's called the nine-point breathing meditation. And uh, so what you do is you visualize there's three uh, channels in your body. <clears throat> They're about the thickness of a, of a straw. Now don't ask me, you know, one of those big straws or one of the little teeth. Just a straw, you know. You can decide what kind of straw you want. Um, okay, so there's a central channel. And it goes from uh, your forehead, this is inside your body, uh, from your forehead up to your crown, and then from the crown of your head, it goes down and it is in front of your spine. Okay, so, uh, you know, this tube that goes down. And these, these three channels, they're all, they're flexible, you know, they're not brittle, and they're not made of concrete, okay? But like like flex flex straws, yeah. So, um, but but they're also they're straight. They're not bent over. Okay. So one goes from here up, and then goes down in front of your uh, spine, and it goes to about four fingers width below your navel. Okay, inside your body. Then you have two side channels, and they start from inside inside here okay and then they also go up and then come down uh, and they're on the right and left of your of the central one you know a little space between them not too far not too close okay and this they both come down on either side of the central channel 
and then they hook into the central channel at that place that's about four fingers width below your navel. Okay? So then the way you start the meditation, and uh, you can use your fingers for this or you can do it without your fingers. Um, but, uh, well, I'll teach you without first. Um, you imagine as you inhale that you inhale through your right channel, the air come the, as you inhale, it go, the air goes up to the right channel, comes down the right channel, okay, to four fingers breath below your navel, goes across into your left channel, and then comes up the left channel as you exhale, and then out your left nostril. Okay? And when you do that, as they say that attachment, the, the left channel is associated more with attachment and the right channel with anger. So as you're doing that, you are exhaling your attachment. Okay? So you do three breaths like that. Down the right, across, and then up the left, and out. And think that you're you know, pure, exhaling all this attachment. You know, the force of the air coming up here is just pushing the attachment, clinging, craving energy out. Three breaths like that. Then you do three breaths in through the left, okay, down, across to the right, and out through the right nostril. And you think at that time that the anger energy is getting pushed out as you exhale. Okay? So then you really feel like these channels, these two side channels are getting cleared from the attachment energy and the anger energy. So three this way, three this way. Okay? Then the last three, you think that the air comes in both nostrils and then it comes down both like this, and then uh, where they hook into the central channel, they, then the air from both uh, channels goes into the central channel, and uh, that's where the ignorance energy is. And then as you exhale, you think that the ignorance energy is coming up and out of both channels, or both nostrils, okay, as you exhale. Okay, so you can do this with, without your fingers. You can also do it with your fingers. I would suggest if, uh, because if you use your fingers, sometimes you make a little bit of noise. So maybe that should only be at the very beginning of the session, so everybody's doing it together, uh, you know, and uh, not in the middle of the session when, when everybody's quiet. But if you do it with your fingers, then um, you, you have your thumb tucked under and your other fingers on top of it. And then with your index finger, okay? So you use the back, your right hand, the back of the index finger. Okay, yeah. Right hand, right hand. Yeah, back of the index finger against the left nostril, okay? Then you would inhale yeah, like that. Get the air, imagine the air going down here. And then when, as it switches over and you're ready to exhale, then you move your finger here and you exhale out of your left nostril. Okay, so you use the back of the, the finger to inhale and then switch it over and you exhale. Okay, so you do three breaths like that. Then you switch, you, you take your left hand, and again, your thumb is tucked in, your hands are on top of it, and the back side of your index finger against your right nostril, okay? And you breathe in, and it goes down, and then when you're ready to breathe out, you switch the finger over and block your left nostril and exhale 
the anger, the, yeah, the anger energy out of your right nostril. You do three like that. And when you do this, you can be taking deep breaths in. You want to really try and, um, you know, make sure you're breathing from your diaphragm. So you can't, don't do these short kind of unhealthy breaths that we get so used to doing because we're stressed out. But instead, you know, really make sure that your diaphragm's moving so that your belly's going out as you uh, inhale. Okay? And then with the last three, you have your hands in regular meditation position. And then inhale through both. And then exhale, imagining it going up and out the central channel. Okay, yeah? Mm-hmm. The first question is, what color are their channels? They have a color, but I can't remember what they are at the moment. Um, but, the and I don't think it's crucial. And the second one, um, in the last three breaths, you're imagining the two side channels feeding into the central channel and coming out. But the cent- central channel ends at your... Yeah, but you imagine the air coming out both nostrils. Uh-huh. And you're breathing in. What, uh, okay, you're breathing out. <clears throat> what was the first thing you're breathing out? You're breathing. You're, the first thing is you're breathing in. Yeah. Okay. And what are you, do you concentrate on breathing in the concept? Well, just concentrate on thinking the air is coming at, you know, and going through the channel, and that, that you're getting the air in the channels moving in a very smooth, consistent way. Yeah. What's the first one? The first one's attachment. Attachment. Okay. Oh, I can't remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Is, is there any reason that the, right, the right-hand side is actually the attachment, but the left hand is actually anger? No, the left hand is attachment. The left hand is anger. Attachment, and the right hand is it. Right side is anger. Yeah. Okay. Shall we try it now? Okay. So we can try it, you know, using using your fingers. And, uh, you know, just do it at, at your own speed and, and see. Oh, I should tell you, if one of your nostrils is blocked, don't, don't you know... <laughs> <laughs> you know, just you know. Then just just breathe as you would, but you're you can still imagine that the air is going in one and out the other. Okay. <laughs>
So before you uh, do it, you might spend a couple of minutes uh, visualizing the channels. Yeah. When you're familiar with it, the channels just kind of, you're quite familiar. You don't need to do that. But at the beginning, it can be helpful to just stop and think and really, you know, kind of with your mind trace where the channels are. Okay, and get, get a, a sense of them being there. And then you know, really seeing how they hook in. And as you're breathing, you know, you're going to also be bringing your attention down to, that, to your navel and that space below your navel. And I think that can be very good for us because we're often our attention so much in our head, you know, to, to get the, the attention down here too because this area is very, very stable. It's a very stable area and, uh, you know, focusing there can help, help your mind kind of settle. Any questions about this? Okay, so maybe try that at the, at the beginning of each session. Um, you can do it once, you can do it twice, you know, three times, whatever, um, you know. But also if you're really feeling that, you know, attachment is bothering you or anger is bothering you or ignorance is bothering you, you know, really focus on that one specifically and really think, okay, you know, that channel now where that energy was stuck, you know, it's, it's been expelled and the, the, the energy is flowing freely there now. Okay? So that can help um, settle your mind when you're, you know, just starting a meditation session. We have people have questions about anything? Yeah. Um. You were saying uh, the other day to, and um, this morning to do the white tie practice around the and do the long run. Uh huh. Do you do that every session? Mm hmm. Is that doing too much psychologizing? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um,. You know, I was talking before about doing the white tar together with the lam rim. And so the question is that doing too much psychologizing. The, the lam rim, the stages of the path, isn't psychologizing, okay? It's um, reflecting on the meaning of the, the Buddha's teachings, okay? Because we've heard a lot of teachings, and sometimes... Uh, you know, we think about them a little bit and then we just, our mind gets distracted by other stuff. And so we're not quite sure what we believe and how well we understand it and, and so on. So when you're doing the analytic meditation on the stages of the path, you're really uh, giving yourself some time to think deeply about these, these uh, different views on life. I mean, it's, it's getting a whole different view on what your life is about, okay? And uh, so if when you do these meditations, it really changes your outlook a lot. Uh, so for example, you know, one of the first ones we do is with a, on a precious human life and just thinking of all the adverse conditions that we could have been born into and all the good conditions we do have and then the meaning of and purpose of having a life like this, what we can do with it. And this kind of meditation is an excellent remedy to, um, to depression, to feeling like our life has no meaning and purpose, to self-pity, yeah. Because we're, you know, so much in, in this culture, we're, we're raised in thinking that somehow we're deprived and, you know, we don't have everything and there's something wrong, you know, we're filled with shame and, you know, there's something wrong in our life or whatever. 
And this whole meditation, when you really think deeply about it, is helping us get in touch with the incredible good fortune we have. Yeah? And when you really get a sense of this incredible good fortune we have, then your life becomes very broad, vibrant and very exciting. Um, yeah? And, it, and then all those thoughts of, that bring the depression and, and shame and so on, there's no space for them because you've familiarized yourself with a different way of looking at your life. Yeah, so it has a, a very strong impact. You know, similarly, if we do the, the meditation on, um, on death and impermanence, it, it shocks the mind that is complacent. You know, our mind that just says, oh, yeah, lots of time, I can do what I want, and just have a lot of pleasure, and don't stress too much, yeah. Uh, but when we really see that our life has meaning and purpose, and then get a sense that, you know, our life is not going to last forever, and we're going to have to leave everything around us, then it, it really wakes us up. Oh, okay, let's not be attached to things. Let's not get too bummed out of thing, about things because none of these things are going to last very long. And instead, let's put my mind into Dharma practice and into really transforming my mind. Okay? And so when you do that too, that, that changes your outlook on life. It changes how you live. Yeah? So these, uh, as you learn the different steps and do them, and really familiar, get your mind familiar with those uh, different outlooks, it, it, it affects you because you're understanding the Buddhist teachings at a very deep level, and that is changing the way you look at life. Okay? And so you're combining this, the Lam Rim meditation, with your white Tara practice, <clears throat> because the white Tara practice, uh, in one way it will help you to purify and accumulate a, a lot of merit. I mean, when you're, um, all this light nectar's coming down through you, you know, you're purifying like mad, okay? Uh, and then also during the different steps of the white Tara practice, there's different, um, understandings from the Lam Rim that you can bring into that. So at the beginning of the, the White Tara practice, we take refuge and generate bodhicitta. Well, there's a whole Lam Rim meditation on refuge. There's several Lam Rim meditations on bodhicitta. So you can really spend some time there and unpack those and, and integrate them with your White Tara practice. Okay. Right. We reflect on a right. Yeah. yeah. And so you would do that either right before Tara dissolves into you or right after Tara dissolves into you. That's the, the time to do it. Okay? And it's good. Uh, sometimes, some sessions, you'll just have a very strong feeling of, wow, I need to think about this particular topic. Maybe it's equanimity, or maybe it's, you know, the disadvantages of cyclic existence, whatever it is. And so if there's something, you know, that comes up and you just think, of, wow, I really need to focus on this one, do that one. But otherwise, you know, and in a general way, as you go into the session, have an idea of which long rim topic you're going to meditate on so that you don't get to that part in the sadhana and then go, oh, now, what Lam Rim topic should I do? Hmm. <laughs> and then get confused. Okay, go into the session saying, okay, you know, when it comes to the Lam Rim, this is what I'm going to do. And it's nice if you can become familiar with all the Lam Rim topics by, you know, cycling through them. Yeah. Although, like I said, there might be something that really pops out at you at a particular time because it's pertaining to something that you're thinking a lot about 
or something that's going on inside of you. Does that answer your question okay? Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Well, we have time to do a very short sadhana then. So, we can uh, do it together, if you like. Uh, I can lead it. Where did White Tara go? What? 52. 52. Okay. Oh, speaking of that, did the um, did we change the melody for the refuge and bodhicitta verse? Because we want to say by engaging in generosity and the other far-reaching practices. We haven't done that one yet. Okay. Okay, then we'll just do the part where we change the positive potential to merit. Yeah? That reminds me, you asked your question, is it still a chance to ask why you changed the wording? Oh, why we changed the wording? Because um, positive potential wasn't so accurate. Not that merit is, <laughs> but it's just that more people are using merit. You know, so it's a more standard term, more people understand what it is. But positive potential, yeah, isn't so accurate, accurate either. It's a difficult concept because it's, it's kind of like it means, you know, the good karma that we've created. So in one way it is positive potential, but... Um, yeah, I was just talking with Jupta and Jimpa about it. He didn't like it. And even Alex, who coined that phrase, he doesn't use it anymore. So, uh, hmm? Well, coming from, coming from a Catholic background, mm-hmm. merit's a very loaded word. Mm. You know, because you're, you know, because it's the, you know, building up, building up, uh, you know, merit so you can go to heaven. So you kind of like, as a child, it's not what it really means, but as a child, when you introduce that idea, mm-hmm. you have this idea that you're like banking these things so that God will like you. Mm-hmm. you know? And so mm-hmm. using positive potential was really good for me for a long time. So uh, that whole uh, thing. But, you know, 30 years down the road, you know, I agree with the idea of going with merit. So I, I think for all of us, you know, for Alex and me anyway, I think uh-huh. there's a certain element of growth, mental growth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just like the way a positive potential sounded in the chant better. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why, I mean, this happens with a lot of these terms. Don't get hung up with the term. If, if you find that your mind is having a problem with a certain term or with what you think the, you know, the meaning of a sentence is, then please ask about it. Yeah, because um, lots of times the terms can, can uh, be very confusing. I'm... Um, Looks like maybe we won't do the sudden in this session. <laughs> but, uh, but I was thinking, like, the term, a lot of people use self-cherishing thought. And I've even been astounded by the people who live here, even though I never use that term, they use it, I think, because they read things. But I don't like the, t- the term self-cherishing thought, because I think we should cherish ourselves. We are valuable. Aren't we? Yeah, shouldn't we cherish ourselves? We cherish other beings, we should cherish ourselves. Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with cherishing ourselves in a healthy way. What we don't want to be is self centered and self preoccupied. 
Okay, so I would prefer to, to translate that term as self-centeredness or self-preoccupation or self-absorption because those things are not very healthy. But cherishing ourselves, we, sh we should. Okay, so that's why, you know, that, uh, that term, I think, you know, really needs, I, I want to, I always use a different term, yeah? Because it's very easy for people to think, and the Tibetans don't always understand uh, how our psychology is, that we start thinking, if I cherish myself, I'm bad because often that was part of our upbringing. You know, don't be selfish. And we think cherishing ourselves is being selfish. Yeah. And I don't think healthy cherishing of ourselves is being selfish. It's being practical. Yeah. We are worthwhile, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We are not more important than everybody else. That's for sure. Okay. And we shouldn't just be sitting there spinning around, me, me, I, I, my, my, mine, mine. Yeah. That's the self-centeredness. But we do, you know, we should respect ourselves. We should have a sense of our own integrity. Yeah. Some self-respect. Some self-confidence. These are all mental factors that are very important for practicing the, the path. But self-absorption, yeah, self-obsession, self-centeredness, that's a big interference. Okay? So that's why, you know, we have to be careful about the terms and, and what the terms mean. Otherwise, it's very easy to think, oh, I, have, I cherish myself so much. That means I should hate myself. I should beat myself up. I should tell myself how, unworth, how worthless I am, and then I won't be so selfish. Okay? Now, I think most people have been telling themselves that how worthless they are for a long time. Has it made you less selfish? Yeah? Does telling yourself that you're worthless make you less selfish? No. Doesn't make you less selfish. I think it leads to craving. Then, then out of that we feel so deficient and then we jump into craving, trying to fill the deficiency. Exactly. So. Exactly. Yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't the spirit of that, though, to get over yourself thinking you're the most pers important person in the universe? Oh, yes. You know, and, and uh, your, I've heard it said before, the self-cherishing mind, that part of our mind that, that uh, thinks me first. Yeah, I'm, I'm not talking, uh, arguing about the concept, I'm talking about the term we use. Okay, but the meaning that we're getting at is this mind that thinks I'm number one. My happiness is more important than anybody else's. My suffering hurts more than anybody else's. My childhood is more worthy of ruminating about than anybody else's childhood. My, you know, traumas in life, my friends, my enemies, my, 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 my health, my, Me you know, first. yeah, all of that. That's what we want to get over. Okay. Yeah. And again, it doesn't mean we ignore those aspects of ourself. No, we look at them, we learn how to think about them properly in terms of the Dharma, but we don't obsess about them. Okay? Because you can see the self-obsession is that thought of, I'm worthless, I'm deficient, I'm full of shame, I'm, you know, 
the most screwed up person in the world. Yeah, we can see that that is, it's an unrealistic way of thinking. Thinking that way is very self-obsessed, isn't it? Isn't it? So, yeah, so don't think self-obsession is I'm the best one in the world. It can also be I'm the worst one in the world. It's any thought that is just spinning around me, I, my, and mine all the time, all day, all night. <laughs> In an interesting dream last night, I was somewhere, I don't know where I was, but as usual, I was packing suitcases. <laughs> because I was going to have to get on a plane and go somewhere. And there were all these suitcases. And some of my friends were there helping me pack. And I could only take two suitcases, you know, because they charge you now. And it, was a, it must have been an international flight because um, <laughs> I could carry these free. So I had two big suitcases I was, I was stuffing. And then all these other suitcases and tried to figure out what to do with them. And so finally got everything I needed to take back in the two suitcases. Two of my friends carried those away. And then somehow I left all the other suitcases there, but there was all this bedding and blankets. And I think I was trying to help somebody, but I was carrying these mountains of bedding and blankets. <laughs> and then there was one tiny little like a um, small case or something that was totally empty, but I thought, oh, I should take that. It'll be useful. <laughs> and so with all these blankets, then grabbing on that thing and then trying to see where I'm going, <laughs> but I can't see with all these blankets, you know? So, <laughs> so I think this dream was telling me something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you put down the empty soup bit cases, don't pick up anything else. Yeah, because that'll blind you just as much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so this, this, you know, how we lug things around with us, all sorts of unrealistic thoughts we lug around with us. And then even the suitcases are left behind. We pick up something else in the name of helping somebody else. And we still can't see where we're going. <laughs> yes? I remember when Alex lives here, we were doing the kitchen. And it's sort of the same analogy, but what he, we have a picture of him. And <laughs> John Pell had been putting the flooring in the kitchen and this really sticky adhesive. And Alex got it all over his body, so Venerable John Powell would take these brushes and these old tools, and he was plastering them all over Alex. We have a picture of Alex with all of this apparatus. So it's like you don't need that. You need a suitcase. That's one way. But you can also carry all your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> stuff on your body. I'm free. My hands are free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Then let's sit quietly just a couple of minutes. Take in what we talked about so you can remember it. And then we'll dedicate. <laughs> 